Right. Um, <coughs> I'm here to talk about the budget, but I want to say just a couple of things in terms of background. Um, does that work? Yep. Yeah. Um, it's how, how we're going to get out of this mess is um, world demand, uh, uh, world economic growth, providing that Europe sorts out its the European financial crisis, um, always assuming. Um, the European economy has returned to growth, and we're getting a share of it. Um, also, the improvement of competitiveness, which we might like to see slightly more rapidly than was suggested by yesterday's data, but still it's happening. And the exports and industrial output have had a very good first three quarters. And what we can see is that Ireland will move into a balance payment surplus next year, um, which will provide a platform for future growth, um, but it's not very employment intensive. Um, and it's only when domestic demand can take over and start growing that you will see um, um, the unemployment rate coming down. And it will also be much more, it will be more tax intensive when domestic demand takes over. Um, consumer confidence that people are scared and they're scarred by what's happened. Um, and I think they're going to be scared for some time to come. The, this budget is not the last. Um, and um, it, it, it is only when domestic demand recovers. Could be 2012 but it could well be 2013. And there was an issue as to whether the incoming government in the 2012 budget should learn from the Obama experience, blame it all on the previous government, and get everything out of the way quickly. Um, um, that, um, and there, there, there are things for it and against it. Obviously, it's very painful. But is, it is trying to get domestic consumers back to believing there's a future. Um, and there are things to be said for and against that. Um, All right. Actually, I'm, I think I'll skip most of these and get on to the budget. In terms of the um, size of the adjustment, I just show here what was done in 2009 and 2010. So this budget is, in theory, taking less out of the economy than the 2009, and what's left to be taken um, um, out of the economy from 2012 to 2014 um, is 4.7 percentage points of GDP. Um, the actual package um, of 15 billion is um, sorry, that, come on, yeah, it is eight and a half percentage points of GDP, which would, um, on a scenario that I think is plausible and possibly on the conservative side, get us to the deficit target of 2014. But what it will do is it will cu cut, obviously, domestic demand below what it would otherwise have been. Um, our estimate is that over the four years, it, the 15 billion will reduce the level of GDP by four percentage points below where it would, other, 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 would otherwise have been. In other words, the growth rate will be one percentage point lower um, um, than it would otherwise have been. It will ex post reduce government borrowing by 5%. You cut 8.5%, and, and it re produces a 5% reduction in borrowing. Um, because the difference, of course, is that there are more people unemployed, fewer people employed, tax revenue is down, and so on. The important thing, and I'll come back to it, is the balance, it would increase the balance payment surplus by five percentage points over and above where it would otherwise have been. So with balance payments moving into surplus, if not this year, certainly next year, you're looking at probably a very large surplus um, by the end of the adjustment period, which is the promise, which is saying that you have probably over-adjusted that um, the economy then could afford to grow much more rapidly for a prolonged period without constraints. And in growing, of course, the government deficit would then move into surplus. Um, it, with a slower period of adjustment, that wouldn't be an issue. But um, um, this period of adjustment, is the, the accelerated pace is essential given the high interest rates. Just in terms of budgets of the past, um, the worst budget of all time was the Richie Ryan budget of 76. Seven, um, 76, um, uh, which was a huge cut in capital. Um, four budgets of the 1980s, um, I think you're in there, Alan, they're um, among the toughest, um, and actually tougher than we saw in 2009. Now, the reason why 2009 and 2010 don't look as tough is because prices were falling by 5%. So if you cut welfare payments by 5% and public service pay bill by wage rates by 5, 15%, um, and way, prices are down 5%. It's not nearly as deflationary as it feels. Um, now, this year's budget, we haven't done the sums yet, I think will be up closer to budgets of the 1980s is because with, uh, with prices not falling by as much. Um, in terms of... Um, 
In terms of composition, um, tax versus expenditure, um, if you look at the latest, latest IMF World Economic Outlook, it is interesting. There is this law that you should always cut expenditure and never increase taxation. And what they say is actually the evidence, and particularly for Europe over the last 40 years, this is not necessarily the case, that a mixture is necessary and appropriate. Um, um, so don't be too ideological on that. My concern about this budget is that taxes are not job, job friendly. Income tax is, um, increases the marginal tax rate and discourages employment. It, and under normal circumstances, employees bargain in terms of real after-tax wage rates, so they would seek higher wages. It probably won't have as much of a negative effect on competitiveness because wage rates are above their equilibrium. It's, it, it will avoid cutting wage rates rather than lead to an increase in wage rates. But still, it's, uh, a pro property tax would have been much more effective and also water charges um, because they would not have affected the incentive to work. And certainly as we come out of the recession, um, would have been um, um, better for, for employment growth. Um, the issue of value for money and expenditure on the capital expenditure side, um, um, we're looking at um, a very different world from the past where the cost of public funds at the margin is 5.83% uh, with uh, very little growth in inflation, it is exceptionally high. So the projects that might have been uh, sensible to do in the past are no longer sensible to do. Um, and there are issues within the public capital program which I think probably need looking at, like there's 500 million to build a road in Northern Ireland, and I'm not sure that the road in the Republic, there's money to build any road in the Republic. Um, to meet up with it. And anyway, the road in the Republic probably shouldn't be built anyway. Um, so there are issues there which I think need to be looked at. Um, I'm not going to go into details. The labour market interventions, the unemployment is different from the 1980s, 90s. The, it, then two-thirds had left uh, school without completing high school, leaving search, whereas now you're looking at two-thirds having done so. Um, and it's one reason why we disagree. The EU Commission and IMF are very pessimistic about the future and see long-term unemployment forever. Um, we see a flexible labour market um, with the bulk of people actually having skills and education which would allow them to find employment in the modern world, unlike the 90, early 1990s. Um, I think there are issues in terms of those who don't have the skills or qualifications are specialised into building construction. In helping them, especially if they have education, they should be able to move into other sectors and will need to do so. So I think that there are issues there, some of which are being tackled in the, in the four-year plan. Poverty traps. I'm not happy that things have been thought through properly um, in terms of avoiding poverty traps in that was the effect of the universal social charge coming in at a very low income level, interacting with the changes in child benefit with a whole range of other measures, was it creating new poverty traps or was it um, uh, reducing that problem? At the moment there aren't jobs, so that isn't an issue, but in the recovery phase there are going to be jobs and will people be better off taking jobs or will they not? And I think we would have much preferred to see child benefit taxed and uh, child benefit, some of the revenue put into actually raising child benefit and getting rid of child dependency payments in the welfare system, which would have helped eliminate a poverty trap rather than possibly create one. So I think that it, it, it's rather smacks of an emergency where we've got to get the money somehow um, and we can't think this through too, great, too, too, too closely. Um, in terms of the EU IMF agreement, it is to a very surprising extent what we had decided to do anyway, what the government had decided to do, what the other political parties signed up to in terms of the 15 billion. And the one area is on banking where we've been forced to put in 10 billion, which we had not intended to do. Um, um, and that is different. There is an issue in terms of getting full value from this agreement. Um, and the headline is the marginal cost of funds is 5.83% and it is very high and it would be nice if we're lower. But pe people don't realise that this is an overdraft facility. At the end of September, we held $24 billion in cash on which we were paying 5% for the privilege of holding that cash because we'd ex borrowed in excess. What an overdraft means is you don't have to hold cash for fear that you can't borrow on the market. So you can use your cash. Maybe use, say, $12.5 billion of the cash next year, in which case you're there's zero cost of funds. You couldn't do that if you didn't have the overdraft. 
Secondly, the thing about the overdraft is the government were still borrowing short at 2% in September. Um, with an overdraft, um, without an overdraft, the government can't borrow short because you'll face every six months a crisis, can we roll it over? With an overdraft at the end of 2013, the government can borrow short for the next two years at maybe 2% or a bit above it. My guess is, and it's interesting, the finance have cal has priced some of this into the figures. One of the reasons that markets think the GDP debt GDP ratio doesn't rise by nearly enough, the reason is uh, clearly, some of this has been priced in. Also, the interest payments don't rise as much peop as people expect because this has price been priced in. As a result of the EU IMF deal, it looks to me as over, over the three years that the cost of borrowing for the government on average will be closer to 4%, whereas we were ex expecting 5% when we were in the markets in the summer, not 5.83%. So this is cutting very significantly the cost of funding for the next three years for the government. There will be an issue in 2013 as to whether we draw down the funds because we've got a lot of debt repayments in 2014. There's going to be a management issue where we may want to build up our cash and so on. Although, if the borrowing for 2014, if you're looking at five or six billion being your total borrowing, um, you're in a very different position once we begin to get out of this mess. But I think that the, the deal actually is probably, with the benefit of hindsight, is actually probably fairly good for us. But there will be an issue as to how we get out of it um, in the end. In terms of um, um, uh, general assessment, we could outperform. There is an upside, which I still believe is possible. Um, um, I think that because of the size of the fiscal adjustment, whereas I thought you'd see a significant return to growth in domestic demand in 2012, it may well be postponed to 2013. And there are issues then about what the 2012 and 13 budgets should do, issues for the incoming government. The very large balance payment surplus has significance, which I want to end on. Um, and it is likely, if, you, if it, one of the things, if you say read Wolfgang Munchau in the Financial Times last week, he was saying he couldn't see Ireland growing at more than 1% a year, nominal. But he doesn't understand that we're a small economy and that everything in our shops is important and everything that we produce is exported. So that if you tax the hell out of the population, we're miserable. We can't buy our cars. We can't have foreign holidays. But it's the foreign producers who are kicked the next time, at the next stage, the multiplier is dramatically smaller in Ireland than it is elsewhere. So that we, it's not pleasant taking 15 billion out of the economy, but it will only reduce the growth rate by one percentage point a year below what it would otherwise have been. That's very unpleasant. It will contribute significantly to the um, high unemployment and keeping it high for longer. But the economy will bounce back, and the evidence is there. Now, I think that the uh, people abroad don't see the evidence, but for me, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Um, that what this agreement gives us is we're out of the markets for the next three years. And if we are right and the economy does show, I think, a reasonable rate of growth of one and three quarter percent next year in spite of everything, people will begin to realise that actually the Irish economy is not dead. So trying to convince foreigners now by telling them things is you're going nowhere. As I said, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. The final thing is just um, the, the albatross round our necks. Um, the banks. Um, this year, the private sector is repaying 12% of its foreign debts net. Um, the public sector borrowed 11.5% uh, abroad, increasing its net foreign liabilities by roughly the same amount. Uh, next year, the government will be borrowing maybe 9% a year, and the private sector will be repaying 10 percentage points of GDP uh, abroad. Um, it's very hard to find a country that went bust, which was actually repaying its debts and running a, 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 lar a significant and increasing balance payment surplus. Um, uh, so what's going on here? Well, what's going on is that normally what would happen is a lot of this repayment of debt would be Irish people putting money on deposit in banks, Irish companies putting on, or companies in Ireland, not just Irish companies, companies in Ireland putting money in deposit, deposit in the banks. The banks then repay their foreign liabilities, or people repay their debts to Irish banks. What appears to have happened is that less than you would expect of this repayment of debt has gone through the net repayment of foreign liabilities has gone through the Irish banking system, um, um, it, 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 in particular over the summer. Um, but in the long term, um, um, uh, this, this repayment will take place. And by, by 2015, we will have net repaid 
um, private sector foreign liabilities, although we've made some of them public, um, of 50% of GDP. And I just show here the flow of funds that this year, um, in 2011, um, in grey, the government will be borrowing less, um, and red is company sector and blue household sector. They're both saving like mad and not investing, and therefore repaying foreign debts. The effect of this on the banking system until the summer, and I just showed the figures here in the summer, is the, blue, the red is the net foreign liability of the banking system, blue is borrowing from the central bank, and green is the total of those two. That's what the banking system owes abroad. It peaked in, the spring, in spring 2009 and was falling rather nicely then, although the composition was changed, we'd become very dependent on the ECB up to the summer. So the effect of this net repayment of foreign liabilities was it was going through the banking system and our net foreign liabilities were falling. We have had a hiccup where nobody believes in the Irish banking system and we've got to restore confidence in that. That's what, what uh, and we're going to pay another 10 billion in to do so. Providing we restore confidence, this issue, which is, there's a story by Simon Carnswell in today's Irish Times um, on how do we get off this dependency on this ECB. Well, part of the way we get off dependency is that we actually repay all our foreign liabilities of the banking system. Now, not all of that 50% will go through the banking system, but providing we get confidence back, given that we're going to be running large and increasing balance payment surplus, this is a necessary consequence of, of that environment and something I think that people haven't really uh, uh, taken account of. Just to finish off, um, we should get down on our knees every morning and say thank you to the ECB. Um, they have bailed us out. Um, we might have preferred them to be even more generous, but um, um, now that we know they're there for the long haul um, and they're not suddenly going to pull the plug, it is very reassuring. The EU IMF ECB deal does provide certain advantages that I think weren't spotted to begin off with, but finance have factored them in in some of their budgetary figures. Um, the costs, of course, are that we've got to put up more banking capital, and there is a possibility that if we have to sell off banking assets quickly now, we may not get a decent price for them. And instead of the banking crisis costing us £35 billion, it could cost us a bit more because of that, whereas if things were allowed to run out, um, we might get by with less. We're going to have to uh, uh, implement another um, uh, uh, three budgets um, uh, uh, tough budgets. There is an issue of what the appropriate timing is going to be, and I think we need to think about it, and I don't know what the right answer is. There's an issue of morale, um, accepting that we need the support. Um, people in the United Kingdom still remember where they were in November 1976. I still remember being at an OECD policy committee meeting and hearing um, a guy called Tietmar, who was number two in the finance ministry in Germany, and a guy called Greenspan, who was chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, both talking in terms I had never heard uh, people talk at international meetings uh, uh, before about the British government and how disgraceful Britain was and so on. Um, I suspect our public servants are having to take a certain amount of this. Um, it was memorable for me, it was memorable for the British, and they remember it um, um, 40 years on, and I think we'll be remembering it long after I'm dead. Restoring competitiveness is the, is the secret to the success. It could happen faster, but it is happening, the repricing of the economy. And finally, there are the issues which are in the four-year plan about doing something about trying to make sure that we don't end up with structural employment in the rest of this decade like we did in the 1990s. Over to you.